Is there a way to do moral, ethical, efficient, and effective marketing where you're providing value? And that's my fundamental belief now. All marketing has to provide value. So much so that it means that even if a person were to walk away from an experience with you having not transacted with you or not bought the thing you're trying to sell, they would have still walking away saying, huh, I learned something or I got some value from that. So if we can go value-based marketing with a call to action and we can place those messages on social media, now you have the perfect blend of how to use direct response marketing on platforms like social media. Because again, the times have changed. And I think if we can just get back to the point of not making crazy, unsubstantiated claims and ridiculous promises and just provide value with a call to action for someone to take that next step with us, then we have a recipe for success on these media channels. All right, today we're gonna to be talking with Nick Kuzmich, superstar digital marketer, veteran, generated over $600 million in revenue using these unconventional strategies we're gonna talk about on the call today. And we're gonna talk about the, the F word actually, funnel, and why Nick does not allow this word to be said in his house. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about the funnel, what's wrong with it, and Nick's breakthrough approach that's doubled his sales and slash cost per client by over 80%. He's going to talk about why you should throw away your lead magnets, your opt-ins, and funnels for good in order to start raking in high-paying customers effortlessly. So we're going to talk about Nick's fast-track process for exclusively targeting solution seekers. So these are high-paying clients who just want results now, not stick stuff to your funnel, your information, or anything else, just results. And he's going to talk about how he pivoted his language away from the how-to folks and started selling the experience, lifestyle, and feeling clients truly want. So we're going to talk about some tactical steps you can apply immediately to land those big spending clients who are ready to invest top dollar. And so if you want to generate more sales with less effort and finally break out of the pack of everyone else, Me Too Marketing, you're not going to want to miss this interview with Nick Kuzmich. Let's dive in. All right. Welcome to today's VidTau podcast. This is VidTau co-founder Ian Naj. And before we get into the content for today, just wanted to let you know that right now you can try VidTau, our YouTube ad library with over 7 million indexed unlisted YouTube ads and landing pages and funnels for free. You can try it for free for seven days. Just go to VidTau.com, V-I-D-T-A-O.com and check it out. This podcast is also sponsored by Inseply.com. Inseply is a direct response video advertising agency, and it's generated over $950 million in direct response revenue for Inseply's clients via video platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Meta, and more. They're experts in both producing high-performing direct response video creatives and also scaling the ad accounts themselves, so expert media buyers, and very important, custom deep data analysis to make sure your tracking and attribution is 100% rock solid and tailored to your unique business and funnels. So if you're already spending at least $1,000 per day on ads and looking to take your results to the next level on platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, Connected TV, and more, go ahead and claim a free brainstorm session with the Inseply team. Just go to inseply.com slash vidtow. That's I-N-C-E-P-T-L-Y dot com slash vidtow and claim a free brainstorm session. And just so you know, this is not a sales call. On this brainstorm session, the Inseply team will work with you to uncover insights you and your team can use to unlock new opportunities and scale on video traffic platforms. Just go to inseply.com slash vidtow to claim your spot. All right, Nick, N Mr. Nick Kuzmich, the legend. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our show, our vidtow <laughs> show. You know, I'm, I'm excited to be here, man. Uh, just before you hit record, I know we're talking about, uh, we met a bunch of years. I feel like it's even longer than seven years ago, but it, it, we, we met a, a long time ago and it's great to like really connect and see what you're up to and see what's happening. It's just, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I first heard about you. I was working for a guy named Ryan Levesque. And so yeah. Ryan was going to do his first big uh, joint venture launch. And he was talking to Todd Herman. So 90 mm -hmm. day year guy. And I remember, I don't know if I was on the call or I was, I heard the recording of the call because I was, uh, yeah, doing a bunch of marketing stuff for him. And Todd said, all right, well, the most important thing for my, he did like a, I don't know how many, it was an eight figure uh, revenue launch, I remember. And he yeah. said, yeah. So be before we get into anything else, just you got to hire Nick Kuzmich. That's, that's, <laughs> that was, the, that was the big thing that moved, moved the needle. And then that led to, uh, and I was like, Oh, who's this new Nick Kuzmich guy? What does he do? And, and then I learned all about what you were doing at the time, um, which was kind of unbelievable. You were just doing all this crazy, I guess you call it dark posting on Facebook. And you had this like lead generation formula that you had, really cracked the code on. So 
yeah, I was really fortunate to get to learn from you. And we actually had a ton of success on Ryan's end back in those days, basically yeah. take, taking what you taught at the time and, and applying it. And then I know you've, you know, you work for huge, huge people, like pretty much who's who. Um, so yeah, really excited to just kind of, yeah, uh, pick your brain a bit and, and hear what you've been up to and, and, uh, sure. just hear how the journey's journey has been going for you. So yeah, that's yeah, why good time. Great, great, great memories. Yeah. And uh, many, many, many more new ones to make. That's for sure. Well, so how did you, how did you get into marketing to begin with? I remember that's an interesting story. Yeah, well, by complete mistake. So, like, I had zero intentions to become a marketer. Hell, I had zero intentions to quote unquote be an entrepreneur. And I do that in quotes because, I mean, everyone's a, an entrepreneur these days. Everyone and their mother. When I think about entrepreneurs, I think about like the Elon Musks of the world and those who are who are creating some substantial change. But hell. If it means that I get to work for myself and build a lifestyle business and help people along the way, then sure, you know, tap me into that. But uh, yeah, it was by mistake. And what I mean by that is like, I'm an only child of immigrant parents. So my father and mother, before I was born, uh, they had their own convenience store. I guess you could call that entrepreneurship, but they had a convenience store where it was open 24 hours. So my mom worked the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift. And then my dad would come in and work the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. And that was it. They were running this store. We always had more month than money. Um, I remember sleeping sometimes behind the counter after school, trying to catch up on Z's when my parents were selling lottery tickets and cigarettes, for goodness sakes. Um, so that was my perception of entrepreneurship. And I was like, I want nothing to do with this. I'm going to go get a stable job. Like I remember being a kid and saying, I'm going to get a stable job. I don't want, I don't want anything to do with this. Um, but then, you know, I witnessed my father have his first heart attack when I was four years old. And this was the beginning of a plethora of times where I ended up being in hospital with my dad. And then in 2005, uh, you know, sickness and illness took him from this world. But what happened was, I think on his third stroke, I was probably 17 or 18 years old at the time, um, it left him partially paralyzed with the inability to continue to work. So they had to shut down this convenience store that was barely making ends meet anyways, but it meant dad had to stop working which meant that my immigrant mom now had to find a job for the first time in her life. And I remember particularly one day she went out for a job interview and she came back. It was Saturday. I was at home watching TV and she came back with tears in her eyes, essentially saying, I applied for a job to be a laundry mat clothing folder. That was her job. Um, and she didn't get the job because she couldn't speak English well. And I think something inside of my mind at that point just broke. And I said, okay, I'm going to figure this shit out. Like, I'm not going to, this is not going to happen anymore. I'm an only child. And essentially at 17 years old, I was like, forced, if you will, to be the primary breadwinner for my family. So I just had to figure it out. And so, of course, <laughs> you do what everyone does. You go to the internet and say, how to make money. <laughs> you know, right? Uh, and what does that give you? It gives you a whole bunch of lists of stuff you probably shouldn't do. Uh, so I started stuffing envelopes. I remember um, joining network marketing companies. I, uh, for a very short stint, uh, worked for Cutco Knives, and I started selling knives door to door. And then I came across this one thing from a guy by the name of Corey Rudel. Now, if you don't know who Corey is, Corey was the, the godfather of internet marketing. He was the first person to ever teach anybody how to sell something on the internet. And he had a book called Car Secrets Revealed. And then he had a course teach calling internet marketing secrets. And I bought the course. And essentially, the advice was this. Write an ebook and go sell it on the internet. I was like, huh. Okay, well, I don't know how to write. And I don't know how to sell. But we're going to figure this out somehow. So I literally wrote an ebook under a pen name because I was too ashamed to put my real name on it. And I started putting it on the internet. I had to figure out, okay, well, now he says I got to sell it. Like, where do I, how do I how do, how do I sell this on the internet? Where do I find eyeballs to buy this stuff? And at that time, I think I was just in the right place at the right time. Google, the 800 pound gorilla had had their panda slap and penguin slap and all these weird animal slaps. I was like, I don't want anything to do with that. Is there anywhere else where I could buy traffic? And at the time, Facebook had just released their ads platform in beta. So this was probably like 2007, 2008. And I said, okay, I'm going to do that. And then I heard someone else say, oh, you could also do the same thing on a website called plentyoffish.com, which was a dating site, but they captured all this data from them, uh, from their users and turned around and built an advertising platform around it. So I was like, okay. And so I just started putting out some basic ads on Facebook and Plenty of Fish when it was the wild, wild west. Then you could say whatever you want, do whatever you want, make it whatever kind of claims you want. And I started spending a dollar and making a dollar 10 back. And I was like, okay, like, 
I think I got this. And so I started spending more dollars and making more dollar 10 backs and started reading more and went to big seminar with Armin Morin and started learning more about internet marketing. And so all of a sudden I'm spending a dollar, making a dollar 50 back and a dollar and $2 back. And this kind of was just my foray into the internet world, if you will. And I think what I just started to understand was I started to study the, the old direct response marketing greats, like all the old school guys, the Jay Abrahams of the world. Um, and simultaneously was learning about this new thing called social media. And I was one of the first few people who understood how do we bridge the two together? Because many direct response marketers were trying to do stuff on social and were getting banned because they weren't following the rules. And a lot of social marketers didn't understand direct response marketing where you get a response from what you do. And I started blending things together. And again, dude, I don't know, right place, right time, uh, universal line, the stars were there started getting some results. People started hearing about it, started getting results for other people. Other big names started hearing about it. And again, I call that the $600 million decision because you go back you know, that many years and see it now, $600 million later in collective revenue through these platforms. And I guess the rest, as they say, is history. So it's been a wild ride, but nothing I ever intended to do or was on purpose. I was just kind of forced into a situation and then just had to figure it out along the way. Wow. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing sort of... Uh... The origin story, man. I think a lot of people can re can relate to that. And it's crazy. So you're talking about the Facebook days. Remember that there was like a, a blonde girl that everybody used for the, the gray image. shirt girl. Yeah, gray shirt yeah. girl. Exactly. The gray yeah. shirt girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was literally, it was a gray shirt girl with blonde hair who had a big smile and showed just a little cleavage on her tank top. And the advice from every marketer at the time was use the gray shirt girl because she was the most highest converting image. And it didn't matter. Like people were selling vacuum cleaners with the darn gray shirt girl. And yeah. she became the most popular person on the internet for a short time. But yeah, that it was the wild, wild west back then. Gray shirt girl was my start as well. So you you actually leveraged that that image asset yourself. That's 100 percent I use gray shirt girl. I don't know how many times before it just did stop working. But yes, she, I took the I don't even know who came up with it, but I heard the advice. I took it and it works. We ran with it. That's amazing. So so let's talk about so your first client, right? So you yeah, you were doing this for yourself, and then somehow how did word get out about the success you'd had, you know, figuring this out on your own? How did that that process happen? Yeah, I think I got really lucky. So what happened was um, uh, I was a pastor for 14 years of my life. And then through a long series of events, decided to step away from that. And this was now 2010, December. My my Christmas Sunday of December uh, 2010 was going to be my last Sunday at, at the church. And I remember just stepping away and saying to myself, I'm never going to step foot in the church for a long time. I just need a break. Um, and I just got to figure out what, what the next steps are for me. And I'd been doing this internet marketing thing on the side as a side hustle. And I was just going to figure out how to transition this. Well, of course, uh, like three days after I, I stepped away, I saw an ad um, in a entrepreneurs group that I was a part of in Toronto. And the ad basically said, Hey, um, I've spent the last 25 years studying from the greatest marketers in the world. I worked for Dan Sullivan as strategic coach. I worked with Joe Polish. I've worked with all these people and I'm condensing everything I know about marketing from the last 20, 25 years. And I'm condensing it into a one day event. And not only that, the event cost, I guess he, I think he was charging like 600 bucks at the time, which was more money than I had. I couldn't afford that. But he said $600 at the time, but here was the pitch. You attend the event first and you only pay on the last day if you felt like there was enough value for it. So I remember thinking, I don't care how good this thing is. I'm just going to say it sucked. So I didn't have to pay the $600, right? Not because not yeah. I wanted to be like devilish about it, but literally yeah. I didn't have the money. And so get this, Ian, you're, I mean, just how the universe works. So the event is called Archangel. It's held at an event center, which was a converted church. So the event center is called the Berkeley Church, and it was an old stained glass, old school church that they converted to use into an event center, and it happened on a Sunday morning. So dude, literally two weeks after I said, I'm never going to step foot in a church again, I'm attending an event called Archangel inside of a church um, on a Sunday morning, of all things. And so I'm sitting there like, darn, like what is going on? And I remember people uh, in the, how he did it was instead of just like introducing yourself, he said, this is how we're going to do it. Everybody's going to get uh, 90 seconds on stage. And on those 90 seconds, you can introduce yourself. But the best way to do it is to share some sort of a nugget or a truth or some value thing that's going to help everybody in the room. And this way, everyone will not only get to know who you are, but will get to identify what you're good at. So I think I was going to just talk about some sort of a productivity hack or something like that. 
But just before that, some person got up on the stage and basically said, how many people in this room use Facebook ads to grow their business? And I I think like 80% of the hands went up. And then the second question was, and how many of you found it profitable? And mine was the only hand that stayed up. And so I had this like light bulb moment right there in the church. It was like the, the sun came through the stained glass and lit up my face and it was all glowy. I was like, oh my God, I think I, I figured this out. So instead of talking about productivity, I went up there and I talked about Facebook ads and a couple of things that people could do to make it work. Because at this point, again, I had been spending a dollar, making a dollar fifty all day long. Hmm. So at that point, I got deemed the Facebook ninja from everybody in that group and people started asking me, but then the host came to me. The host was a, a dear friend of mine still to this day, a guy by the name of Giovanni Marsico. And he came to me and said, Nick, I, I love what you said. We're going to be holding an event in I think three months time in March in Los Angeles, because it's the city of angels and his company's called Archangel. And here's the requirements. I want a hundred people in the room and every one of them has to be making over a million dollars. Now I don't have a contact or a network in LA. So we've got to do this hundred percent ads. Are you up for the challenge? And I was like, nothing to lose. I can't guarantee anything, but let's go. And so long and short of it is we filled the room with a hundred entrepreneurs, all who made over a million dollars. And we did it hundred percent via Facebook ads. And this was the launch of his business. It literally launched to what it is today. And today he's got this beautiful, great mega business that helps uh, your world changers. But here's, here's answering the question. I know it's a long winded way to get there. When I was there, a couple of people who worked with Joe Polish were there and Gio Giovanni introduced me to everybody as the reason you're here is because Nick filled this room with Facebook ads. And so one guy pulls me aside, guy by the name of Jeremy says, Hey, you do Facebook ads? I say, yeah, I do. He goes, I want you to introduce you to a guy named Dan. Dan is Joe Polish's right hand. Um, and they're looking for a Facebook guy. So literally that moment I got on the phone with a guy named Dan. I love Dan, Dan Cushell, still doing amazing things now. Um, and he said, Hey, when you get back from this event, let's talk. We ended up talking and he said, and then they hired me to do ads for Joe Polish's stuff. And we did Joe Polish's ads for a bunch of their events and got some ridiculous 2000% ROIs. So of course, Joe knows a lot of people. And then Joe started telling other people about me. And as you know, that's kind of how it works in that world is once you do one good work for one person, they introduce you to others. And so that was the beginning of me being able to work with, well, let's just call them A-listers. Um, and they they shared with others and they shared with others and kind of the, the reputation grew. So again, dude, right place, right time, did some really good work, got some really great results, was introduced to some really great people. And I mean, the whole thing snowballed from there. So you said something really interesting, and that was, you know, taking the principles of direct response and then combining it with sort of the, the medium, let's say, you know, social media. Yeah. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, what just taking a fast forward, because, uh, you know, to to 2023 and yeah. is our direct response principles still working now? And if so, how how have you seen things change over over this time frame in terms of how they yeah, work? It's such a great. It's such a great question. And and for definition, for those who don't understand, there's like, there's marketing. Uh, some people might even call that branding. Like if you're driving on the, on the freeway and you see a billboard of someone wearing a Chanel purse and they're trying to sell Chanel, but that's all it is. It's just a, 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 a picture or an image of someone holding a purse with the brand underneath Chanel, right? That's marketing to, to some people. A lot of big brands do that. Direct response for those who just need some understanding is marketing that gives someone a call to action to take right away in order for you to measure the results. So if we were to redo that banner ad, for example, for Chanel, it would say, hey, new Chanel, whatever name of the thing, special on now, go to this website to claim your offer. And so the only difference between direct response marketing versus you know regular marketing is essentially the ability to call, uh, give a call to action and to measure the result that comes as a result of that. So that's direct response just for those who are who are clear. But the problem with a lot of direct response is it's an unregulated industry. In other words, you could say anything you want and get away with it virtually. Now, times have changed a little bit, but that's where the direct response old school marketers were making these crazy claims, right? Lose 1,400 pounds in 14 hours with this one new pill that we found in the depths of the Amazon. 
That's direct response marketing traditionally. You can basically make any claim you want about anything. Doesn't really need to be all that substantiated in order to get someone to take a response. And so you have this entire group of amazing entrepreneurs and business owners who are the forefathers of direct response marketing. And that's how they did it. But they usually do it through like letters or postcards or long form sales letters and that sort of thing. And then over here, you have social media that came on the scene. And you got to remember the context of social media. People came on just to connect with others. The example I like to use is nobody wakes up in the morning with a credit card in hand going on to Facebook or YouTube or one of these channels ready to buy something because they're not commerce platforms. They're social platforms. If you go onto Amazon, of course, your intention is to buy. So it makes sense to try to sell something, but not so much on social. And so what you start to have happen where direct response marketers were coming onto social platforms. So remember, really aggressive claims, unsubstantiated, were coming onto a platform where people are like, I'm not here to buy anything. So I'm like, what are you doing? And then they started to bring this message to the social platforms. And of course, over time, Facebook and Meta and some of these platforms got smart. And they're like, this is absolutely ludicrous. You're not allowed to say these unsubstantiated claims. You can't make promises that aren't true for everybody. And all of a sudden, the direct response marketers were like, what do we do? Oh, my God. We can't make these claims. How are we going to make anything work? Our conversion rates are going to tank. And so the question about like taking direct response marketing and using that on a social platform, does it work if we use the purest sense of what direct response marketing is? And that is, can we do marketing that asks for a call to action? If that's the purest sense of the question, yes. Absolutely. I think marketing without some sort of a call to action is not the most intelligent play. Now, we just have to avoid all this crazy promise hype and all that. But the times have, in fact, changed. And you, you, you made a great point. Back in the day, back in the gray shirt girl day, yeah. you could say whatever the heck you want. I remember I was running ads for a weight loss thing, and I'd be canceled if I said this today. But I would show pictures of we did market research, and this was women's weight loss. We found at that time, this is a long time ago, that one of the greatest things that women wanted to do or the, the why they wanted to lose weight was because they couldn't fit their calves into knee-high boots, you know, the mm -hmm. ones that zip up in the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the market research told us that. So we literally put images on Facebook of like really big calves not fitting into boots. And the headlines were like, fat calves? Like, no, you can't say that now. That's <laughs> yeah. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. But back in the day, you could. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm trying to make here is, um, is there a way to do moral, ethical, efficient, and effective marketing where you're providing value? And that's my fundamental belief now. Mm -hmm. All marketing has to provide value. So much so that it means that even if a person were to walk away from an experience with you having not transacted with you or not bought the thing you're trying to sell, they would have still walked away saying, huh, I learned something or I got some value from that. So if we can go value-based marketing with a call to action and we can place those messages on social media, now you have the perfect blend of how to use direct response marketing on platforms like social media. Because again, the times have changed. And I think if we can just get back to the point of not making crazy, unsubstantiated claims and ridiculous promises and just provide value with a call to action for someone to take that next step with us, then we have a recipe for success on, on these media channels. For sure, for sure. And I think that that really takes me back to, I remember the seminar I went to that you did, it was uh, the art of lead generation. So sure. I remember, and uh, and I remember you had, yeah, I still have the book actually. It's um, so it's the like the, the you had the perfect ad formula, and then you had the right. uh, it was like the the perfect lead magnet. So, yeah. uh, can you it's just like I, I and I, I still see this stuff work. This is just how things work. It's just like human psychology. I, can sure. you just walk us through for the people on the on the on the call here? Like, what makes what what is a lead magnet? First of all, for maybe people don't know, um, where can you use it in, in businesses, and what what makes a good lead magnet? Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but I, what I will say is depending on what you sell, mm -hmm. and, and this was a revelation that I had two, two years ago that has changed the game completely for me, because I felt like when I came up with what I called the art of lead generation process, which was essentially add to lead magnet, lead magnet to offer, and that offer could be selling a course, a program, uh, getting someone on a call to sell your higher ticket thing or whatever, I literally felt like I found the holy grail of what works better than anything else on social media platforms. And that was true for 13 years. It was true. This is what we did. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll answer the question about a, a good lead magnet in just a second. But what I found is right now, I primarily only work with businesses that sell what might be called a premium service or known in our industry as a high ticket offer. Uh, usually someone that has selling something that's $5,000 up to $100,000, dollars usually requires a phone sales to close that or enroll that person into your business. And um, if you're thinking about that, so if you're a business owner for that, I would say that the role of the lead magnet has become irrelevant. Mm. It is actually a deterrent from your per perfect prospect, not something that will attract them. But if you're selling courses or how-to programs and things that are a little bit lower ticket, then I think a lead magnet is a perfect play to help get you there. So maybe we'll talk about the lead magnet thing first for the people who sell lower ticket. And then if you want, we could talk about those who sell premium and why the lead magnet is a bad idea. Absolutely. But ultimately at the end of the day, we have to realize that if, if you're selling how-to information by means of a course, and by by the way, I just if I have a second to riff on that, if you're selling a $250 course or whatever it is, something in the information space, I would always heavily, strongly suggest that one person considers not selling a $250 course, but selling a $2,500 program that includes the $250 course. But we all know and I don't know about you, Ian, but I'll be the first to admit it. I don't know. Uh, throughout the years, the countless number of courses I've bought. Now, I thought it stopped buying courses, God, long time ago. But in the early years, when I bought courses, I bought countless number of courses. And the number of times I completed a course from start to finish was zero. Zero. Zilch. None. Now, I got through parts of courses. I never finished one start to finish. So... That's a whole other thing. But I think if, if someone has the ability through content and information to truly transform someone's life with that content, then the course is not going to create the transformation. It might create a quick transaction, but it won't create transformation. So depending on what your intents or goals are, if it's only transactional, by all means, sell as many bloody courses as you can. But if it is transformational, if you just take that same course content, but you layer on top of it accountability or coaching or support or a community or whatever you want to call it, now you have a delivery mechanism that you could charge substantially more for. And the benefit is, A, you get more money. B, the person getting involved is going to be a higher caliber person who's most likely going to finish it now because they, they've got more skin in the game. And C, they win because they're going to be transformed by not just taking a course, but being involved in a program. So, you know, for my whatever my two cents are worth, I would love to have that conversation with people that say, look, if you really want transformation, think about selling a premium service versus just a lower ticket one because you're going to get better results. However, I, I, I digress. <laughs> if we're talking about the person selling the course, it's typically someone who's looking for some how-to information. And the gap between, hey, I want to accomplish a result, and then I'm going to part with my $300 or $400 or whatever it is you charge for the course, there's a gap that needs to be filled there. And one of my fundamental beliefs, as you already know, is that we need to provide value in advance of asking for a transaction in a case of a lower ticket item. And so the figure, what I figured out was, well, we have to do that by means of a lead magnet. And why a lead magnet? Because, you know, there's challenges out there. There's summits out there. There's free plus shipping book offers. There's mini courses. There's webinars. But we have to remember that all of those things are great, but we want to look for the fastest, quickest, most efficient means to deliver value in a way that has that person finish the value and then want to come back for more. A webinar, it's a little bit long to get require someone an hour of their time to sit on it. A four-part mini series, that's five or six days that they're never going to get to the end. A mini course, same sort of thing. A summit or a challenge, you see 100 people start the challenge or the summit and 10 people finish it. So we're missing out all that lead leakage. So when all of the research we've done, we found a lead magnet, and I'll just define that as a short one to three page PDF downloadable document is the most efficient way to acquire a, a, a qualified prospect for the customer that you're looking to sell. So that's why we say lead magnets. Now, why, you know, what's important of a lead magnet? Here's the number one mistake I see most people make with the lead magnet. And that is this, they simply give the content and then they walk away. Right. And a good friend of mine, Tacky Moore tells a story about when he was in, I think Sydney, Sydney Harbor as a little kid, his dad took him to the, to the Harbor and there was a street performer there. And the street performer did this amazing tricks and songs and all this kind of stuff. And at the end of his performance, everybody started clapping like, wow, that was amazing. Good job, man. And the guy yelled back to the crowd, don't clap, put money in the bucket. 
But yeah. that's exactly what a lot of us as information marketers do, right? Yeah. We like offer this lead magnet or this webinar or whatever, and it's really good content. Everyone's like, oh, wow, that was good content. Good on you, Ian. Oh, I loved it. But they don't transact. And that's because all we do is give them content. So I believe a lead magnet has two purposes. One, capture the lead, but also number two, to pre-frame the sale. So in this case, I say every lead magnet needs three core elements to it. An introduction, which essentially introduces you, your credibility and authority, also pre-frames the sale for the next thing and seeds the idea that this lead magnet is one smart, small part of a much bigger concept or a bigger framework. Because if you do that job right, then the person says, wow, if this was this good and this is just one part of eight parts, well, I want the other seven parts. That's your course or the thing that you're trying to sell. So that's important. So there's an introduction that has a seating and a preframe. There's the content itself, which is the body. And that should literally be designed in such a way that it can be delivered on one page. So it's a blueprint, a checklist, a template, a cheat sheet, whatever it be. And then a conclusion slash call to action that says, a damaging admission. Hey, I, I I think you found this to be very good and helpful, but let's just be real. A one-page PDF is not going to change your business. That's why it's one small part of a bigger thing. And if you're interested in about the bigger thing, come over here and learn about that bigger thing. So tease it up. So anyways, I mean, that I went off a little bit on that, but the importance of a lead magnet is, again, the selection of the appropriate thing that seeds the bigger idea, not just to give content, but to pre-frame the whole thing and to put that in front of your ideal prospect, I think then you have a really good chance as utilizing lead magnets to actually help sell your low ticket course or program. Got it. And then you said something amazing earlier, which is for higher ticket, 5K, 150K on up, lead magnets yeah. are irrelevant. So what do you do instead? Yeah. How do you approach trying to sell those kinds of services? I love that. And thank you for asking, because this is what I've dedicated the last two years of my life. And it's so much so that I, I want I want everybody in the world. So in my house, Ian, we have a swear jar. Um, and every time you say the F word, you've got to put money in it. But in, in my house, the F word is not fuck, it's funnel. Every time you say the word funnel, <laughs> it's a swear word in my house and amongst my clients. If you mention this thing without properly context and pre-framing it with an adjective like slow, outdated, useless, you're not allowed to say the word, period. And here's why. Because all these years I was running this, this funnel process, quote unquote, right? Where I had an ad that led to an opt-in. And that's what I'm defining a funnel. A funnel simply means that you're driving someone to an opt-in because you have this belief that leads need to be nurtured in order to make a transaction. And here's the thing. If you believe that myth and that delusion, then you have no choice but to come up with a funnel. And the problem is when that funnel stops working, you have no choice but to think about how do I make a better version of that? Oh, the, the webinar didn't work. Let's do a quiz. Oh, the quiz didn't work. Let's do a challenge. Oh, the challenge didn't work. Let's do a low ticket thing. Ah, oh, the low ticket thing didn't work. Let's do a community. And we go through this list and list and list of, of things to try and figure out and crack the code. But here's what I realized. If you look out into any world, and this is where it applies particularly to premium services, selling higher ticket things. If you look out in, in, into any world, there are two types of prospects out there, information seekers and solution seekers. Let's just define the difference as the foundation for all of this. An information seeker is just that, somebody who is perpetually seeking more information in order to get how-to information to solve a problem that they have. But the problem is most of them are not actually looking to transact. They're looking for free information. And this is why they hop from funnel to funnel, perpetually looking for more information because they're like, oh, I just need to get it. I need to get it. I need to get it. Most of the time they're looking for just in, uh, they're looking for just in case information versus just in time information. And I don't know if you know the difference, but some people are like, oh, I'm going to learn how to do a webinar because one day in 10 years, mm -hmm. I I might host a webinar. That's useless information to you right now. Get it when you need it. But the point is information seekers, again, are slow to action. They're unmotivated. They are just looking for freebie information, which is why when we put out information like, let me show you how to blank in this lead magnet, or let me show you how to blank in this webinar or how to whatever, they get on. And this is the part that boggles me the most. If you're really good at marketing, you celebrate a one to 3% conversion rate. Like, oh, we got all these leads in here. Oh, one to 3% convert. We're, we're rock star. One to 3% tells me that there's something drastically wrong with the process, that we're going after the wrong person. So the information seeker, again, it's a person who asks how, not who. They have more time than they do money, and they're not looking to take action right now. 
right? Now, a solution seeker, on the other hand, is someone like me, someone who will never opt into a webinar, never opt opt into a lead magnet, or if I do, I'm giving my false information just to see what's on the other side of the gate. But for the most part, I'm not looking for information. I'm not asking, how do I solve my problem? I'm asking, who can solve this problem for me? And I'm willing to pay top dollar to get the right person in my world to take care of this problem and off my hands. I value time more than I do money, which is why I'm willing to spend premium money not to sit through someone's long, you know, a, a funnel that's really like guided as a how-to information when really all it is is a marketing pitch. And I'll give you a great example of this. I was on Instagram the other day and I saw this amazing ad. Like the dude knew what he was saying. He lit it up and it was for some sort of like productivity thing. And he's like, oh, uh, science, neuroscience proves this and it's an external trigger and it'll accomplish it. And, and literally 15 seconds into the ad, I'm like, I don't know what this is, but I'm ready to buy. 2,000 bucks, 3,000 bucks, I don't care. Sounds like it's something I could benefit from. So I would go through the whole ad and I click the button on the bottom of the ad that says learn more. And guess what it took me to? A webinar. Mm-hmm. And guess what I did? Gave him the finger. There's no <laughs> chance you're yeah. going to get any more than 30 seconds of my time. Now, if you took me to a page that says it's $3,000, come buy it, I would have bought it like that. But I didn't because you didn't value my value, which was time over money. So the whole point of this is in every industry, you have solution seekers who are asking who, who have more money than time, who are looking for a quick result, who understand marketing are not going to go through a traditional process. They're not going to waste their time through all that. They're just looking for a result and they're looking for it now. And if we put resistance points in the way of them, i.e. opt-in pages and webinars and things that take time, they're just going to bounce and go on to the next thing. Now, here's here's the part that, that blows my mind. I don't know who invented the funnel and I'll give them full credit. They changed the game when it came to internet marketing. But... 99% of every marketing funnel on the planet is geared towards the information seeker, which in my opinion is our worst prospect as a premium seller is our worst prospect. They take too much time to convert. They need to be nurtured. They need all this kind of stuff. Whereas the solution seeker is a very simple prospect who's willing to take an action right now, as long as we do a few things. So when I had this aha moment, I said, well, you know, F the funnel. What's the point of that? They're not going to opt in. They're not going to go through a long process. I was targeting people and I wanted to get people who are just like me, solution seekers who want fast results. So I changed the model up and I said, well, forget the lead magnet. That's going to be a deterrent for a solution seeker. Forget the webinar, forget anything that requires an opt-in. Those are deterrents for solution seekers. In fact, uh, Jesse Elder, a good friend of mine, says that uh, funnels are like speed bumps to supercars, right? They just get out of the way. I want to go. I want to go fast and I want to get to the finish line. Don't put these speed bumps along the way. So long story short is again, we eliminated the opt-in and we came up with a process that I call the fast track. And this is not designed for the information seeker. This is not designed for the person who needs to be nurtured over time before they make a transactional decision. This is a very simple process that goes add to a very specifically designed lander that does a couple of things. It speaks to the pain point. It doesn't promise I'm going to teach you any how-to information like most do. It speaks to the pain points, offers a solution, mitigates the risk, puts a little bit of social proof on there, and essentially says, let's have a conversation to see if we're a good fit. Mm-hmm. And here's what happened when I did that. The moment I, my old process, add to opt-in, opt-in to call offer, generated calls for me in my busy, like, you know, business building niche, between six and $800 a call. Now, it's a little bit high. The economics still worked out, but it wasn't great. And I thought, man, I'm teaching people fast, medium, and slow lane. I'm teaching people information seeker versus solution seeker, but I'm still putting an opt-in in the process. And I got this idea, what if I eliminate the opt-in page altogether? And what if I reworked my offer page to speak the language and the nuance of the solution seeker, not the information seeker, which is a very big shift. It's subtle, but it makes a big difference. And all of a sudden, here's what happened. We started generating calls at $180 a call versus $800 a call. My volume went up 4X in terms of total numbers of calls. And my conversion rate on calls went from 25% to 34% overnight. And the people who are coming into the business are great ambassadors. They're not paying in the ass people, like all, you know, all that other stuff. So the 
overall net net benefit is more leads, less costs, higher conversion rates, better leads, better ambassadors, better word of mouth, better referrals. And it changed the game for me. So when I thought about, well, okay, well, that, that's interesting. Maybe that's just me. What if I just did it with other niches? So I opened up a beta group and I said, I want people from the health niche, the insurance niche, the financial services niche, the business building niche. And I got a bunch of people and 10 of them in all different niches and spaces. And I said, will you roll with me to try and roll out this process for you? And we started seeing the exact same results. Heavily reduction of cost, of cost, for, you know, qualified call on the calendar, increase in the volume and increase in the conversion. And at that point, I knew we struck gold. And I said, this is all we're going to do. And so the last 18 months to two years, we've been focusing only on that. And the results have been absolutely incredible. Wow, that's awesome. And what, so in both your initial pilot study on that and in the sort of beta group, what, how, how did you have to think about reframing their offers and what they're actually selling. How did that factor into all that? Yeah. Well, so again, at the end of the day, I think we've just been so trained to speak to the information seeker, right? And so the language of our marketing is, let me show you how to do this. Here's a neat little trick that does this. Here's, And again, it's, it's appealing to that desire internally for these folks to want to learn how-to information. So that was the first thing. You got to realize solution seekers don't want to learn how-to anything. They want a result and they don't care the how to to get there. So I think that's the first initial frame that everyone has to change and understand is let's move that. Now, moving to the next goal, like the offer, most people who sell high ticket have this weird delusion that the more stuff I give, the more valuable it is. And so if I'm going to charge, you know, 5,000, I've got to put this much stuff. If I'm going to charge 15,000, I got to put this much stuff. If I'm going to charge 50,000, I got to put this, this much stuff. And I think what people don't realize is because we've been marketing to information seekers, that was partially true. But the solution seekers, less is more. Mm -hmm. They don't want more stuff. They just simply want the end result in the shortest, easiest, less stuff way to get there. And so from an offer perspective, people have to start trimming down their offers. Because if you talk to a solution seeker like me and say, hey, you know, we can get you X, Y, Z result. I'm like, okay, how do you do it? Well, we're going to need this, this, and this, and you're going to get this course and this thing and all this stuff. I'd be like, dude, I am out. Just get me the result. And I don't want to ever talk to you. You don't talk to me. I don't talk to you. You get the result. Here's my money. Like, take it. So I think that's another positioning that people had to, to realize. And then the third part that I will say in presenting the offer is that solution seekers never, never question the cost. They always have the money to, to, to get it. What they are asking is, what is the value exchange? So it doesn't matter if you charge five, 15, 50, or $100,000, the cost is irrelevant because the solution seeker can pay for it. What they're asking in their mind is, if I give you that money, what is the value I get in exchange for that money? So it has to be a value-driven question versus a cost-driven question because all solution seekers are ready and prepared to invest. It's how we've built our lives. It's why we know we get the results that we do. But it has to be presented in such a way that there's a clear value exchange there. And once you can show the solution seeker that, hey, here's the value, it doesn't matter what the price is, as long as that value outweighs the investment, you get a win every single time. So those are a couple of ideas to think about the nuanced mm -hmm. changes that when you're approaching premium service or premium and prospects, it's a different conversation and a completely different game. But here's what I suggest to everyone to realize is that our greatest opportunity, if we sell premium, our greatest opportunity is not coming up with the next latest, greatest funnel. That's just competing against everybody else in your space. Your opportunity is to go when everybody else is focusing on 99% of your competitors are focusing on the information seeker and the next great, greatest, best funnel. You go the complete opposite direction and you say, well, that's fine. We're going after solution seekers with a fast track process. And now you have no competition. You're not mm. competing against the same group of people as others. And that, my friend, right now, I believe, is the greatest window of opportunity for those who sell premium. It's to take advantage of that type of prospect with a very simplified process and you'll win until everybody else catches up, essentially. Got it. That's 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 fantastic. So just a couple sort of tactical questions. How do you actually yeah. approach really pivoting that language from going after the information seeker to really understanding what it is that's going to really spark interest in those solution seekers? Yeah. So the, the, I mean, it's, that's an hour long conversation if we want to dive into it, but really at its core, again, it's understanding what is the need of the solution seeker. We've been so trained 
to think that we just need to provide how-to information as a means to get someone to take an action. That's true for an information seeker, but it's not true for a solution seeker. So when we have to pivot the language, we have to get into the mind and role and perspective of a solution seeker. And maybe the people who sell premium services are solution seekers themselves. Maybe they're not. I know I'm a solution seeker. So I just had to start to ask myself, what would that need to be true for me? What do I want? What makes sense? What's going to make me tick, right? What are the things that are the problems that I want solutions to versus somebody else? And once I started getting very intimately aware of the bigger, higher level principles of solution seekers, i.e. they value time more than money, i.e. they want to pay for a solution, they'll pay top dollar, i.e. it's a value exchange, not a cost exchange. Like Those are the higher level things you have to communicate. And then the core things are understanding what is it that your actual ideal prospect wants? Because I think most of us miss that. We think they want an outcome. Well, here's a great point, actually. We think that people want results which to a certain degree is true, but they don't actually result want results. They want an outcome. But they don't actually even want the outcome if we think about it. They want the experience that comes with the outcome. But they don't actually want even the experience that comes with the outcome, do they? They want the feeling that comes with the experience that comes from the outcome based on the results that they're getting. And here's a classic example. Like um, earlier this year, was it this year or last year? Last year. Um, I bought a new car, car I've been eyeing for a long, long time. Uh, I spent way too much money on it, but it was a car that I really wanted. So McLaren 765 LT, it cost me $800,000 to buy the car. Now, did I buy it because I wanted a nice grocery getter to go to the mall and come back and get my, my stuff? No, they could have. Did I buy it because it looks great? Yeah, it looks really great, but that's not going to have me part with that kind of money. Did I buy it because it's super fast? Yeah, it's hell. It's heck. It'll beat 99% of the things on the road out there. But is that why I bought it? No, absolutely not. I bought it because of how I feel when I get in that car and I push the gas. I bought it because how I feel of when I get out of the car, all the little kid boys are like, dude, good for you. You inspire me. That makes me feel something inside. That's why I bought the car. So most people, if they were to sell a McLaren to a solution seeker, they'd be like, look, it's got a twin turbo, this kind of engine, 790 horsepower with dual exhaust, blah, 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 blah. Who gives a damn? Nobody cares about that. But that's how most of us sell premium. Instead, we're not selling to the deeper needs of the individual on the inside. And again, remember, um, solution seekers, they like things like status. They like their time back. They like opportunity. They like to know in, that they've invested in something valuable. They like impact. When you have those kind of conversations, it's completely different. And that's why I've literally dedicated the last two years of my life to understanding the buying behavior and the psychology of premium prospects and architecting and designing fast processes for them. Because once they know this, it's game over. Like the business who knows how to speak to a solution seeker, market to and attract that person, you win because now you're not competing against anybody else. And it's a, it's, a, it's a shift that a lot of people have to make. And I get a lot of pushback. Well, what do you mean? We don't need leads and build a list and build an organic following and do all that. Like if you want to, by all means, go ahead and compete in a red, red ocean. But if you want to truly be in a blue ocean, this is an opportunity for premium, premium uh, uh, prospects and premium service business owners because there's this, just this gap. When everyone else is going left, you can go right and you can make a big impact. That's, that's amazing. Really, a lot of food for thought for a, a lot of us, Nick. So clearly, you got a lot of a, a lot of things to say about this, and a lot of things for people to try <laughs> out. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, where where can anyone listening go to learn more about what you got going on, and 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 learn about more about your process? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of ways. I'll have to give you a website that you can include in the show notes or below the yeah, video or yeah. whatnot. Um, if you're watching via mobile, I can give you a number to text. That's we that if you're watching this thing, if you're not listening, this makes no sense. Um, but if you're if you're if you're watching, you can text the word fast to the number that you see on the screen. That'll just send you links to basically everything that we're talking about and give you an overview. And then if it makes sense to you, you can schedule a call. Um, but yeah, ultimately at the end of the day, I, I just encourage people who are not selling premium to think about how you can turn your non-premium into premium because you'll have greater impact and greater you know results that way. And those who are selling premium, think about the opportunity that lays before you where if you just pivot away from traditional info-based marketing 
and realize that there is a solution seeker out there and every niche has it, who's ready to take an action, take it quickly. There's a great, there's just a great opportunity for people to understand uh, what is available to them. So um, yeah, there's a lot of content that I put out there. We've got a, a, a weekly newsletter that you'll get if you text us as well uh, on a weekly basis about what we do and how we do it. You'll see some videos and a bunch of stuff. It's all, it's all there for the taking. Awesome, Nick. Well, so great to have you on, on the call. And I'm, I'm excited to learn more about everything that you've done evolving into this the current current uh, thing that you're doing. So it makes a lot yeah. of sense. And thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge with us. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the next conversation. Yeah, dude, it was great spending time with you. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Thanks for checking out the show today. Remember that you can claim your seven-day free access to vidtow.com, our app with over 7 million unlisted YouTube ads, landing pages, and funnels. Just go to vidtow.com to start that free trial. This podcast is also sponsored by Inceply.com. Inceply is a direct response video advertising agency, and it's generated over $950 million in direct response revenue for Inceply's clients via video platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Meta, and more. They're experts in both producing high-performing direct response video creatives and also scaling the ad accounts themselves, so expert media buyers, and very important, custom deep data analysis to make sure your tracking and attribution is 100% rock solid and tailored to your unique business and funnels. So if you're already spending at least $1,000 per day on ads and looking to take your results to the next level on platforms like YouTube, YouTube Shorts, Connected TV, and more, go ahead and claim a free brainstorm session with the Inceply team. Just go to inceply.com slash vidtow. That's I-N-C-E-P-T-L-Y.com slash vidtow and claim a free brainstorm session. And just so you know, this is not a sales call. On this brainstorm session, the Inceply team will work with you to uncover insights you and your team can use to unlock new opportunities and scale on video traffic platforms. Just go to inceptly.com slash vidtow to claim your spot. All right. Thanks so much for checking out our show and being part of our community. Once again, this has been Vidtow co-founder Ian Naj signing off. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world and take care.